Uh, does anybody need a handout? I got a couple up front here. Jan, okay. It's $5 each, but a discount for you. It's worth 10 Anybody else? Okay. Amber, you got any more? Anybody else? Okay, anybody else? Grab them while I'm getting warmed up. Uh, there are two pages, and I, uh, you know, really, I'd love everybody in the room to have one because there's a checklist on it. Anybody see the checklist? Can you just say, oh, boy. Uh, it's a serious checklist. <clears throat> uh, so, Pastor Mark, no, I'm not going to finish Ephesians this morning. <laughs> well, what, I, what I've done here is just kind of anticipated what's coming, what Pastor Mark will be teaching in the future, and uh, I think if we anticipate where we're going and we read ahead and stuff, then when he teaches on it, it's going to be that much more effective, amen? Anybody? Oh, that was pretty weak. I'll give you one more chance. <laughs> so Mark Bowling's going to help me install a little buzzer here. It's the amen buzzer. Just a low voltage shock. It won't, you know, it won't hurt you. <laughs> so uh, I want to just, I, I love the concept of context. Context, uh, one of these days I'm going to hopefully have a chance to teach on uh, hermeneutics, uh, which is just how to interpret scripture, or it could be how to interpret Shakespeare, but I, I don't do that kind of hermeneutics. I just do biblical hermeneutics. But one of the key things about interpreting scripture properly is to look at it in context. So for the sake of context, we're just going to quickly look over where we've been in the last uh, several months, really, since September, right? Uh, since before sep since you before you were installed. That's right. Sounds like you're a light bulb or something. You know? <laughs> so, so here's, as we look at uh, the first 14 verses of chapter 1, we found out that we are loved, we are family, we are free, and we are forgiven. That would have been pretty good if that's all that the book of Ephesians told us. Uh, the second, second half of that chapter says we're invited into eternal life. We are God's treasured possession. I just want that to sink in a second. You are God's treasured possession. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Man, that's a good thing. And we are energized with his mighty power. Uh, chapter 2 in the beginning says that we've been raised from death with Christ above all powers. So does the enemy have power and authority over you? No. Why not? Are, because you're amazing and tough? No, because you're in Christ. Amen? You're in Christ and he can't mess with Jesus. And we've been saved by grace. That means we didn't deserve it, right? We've been saved by grace through faith to do good. Uh, the second half of chapter 2 says that through the cross, Jesus destroyed human divisions by uniting us in him. Does our world need that today? Man, yes, we're united in him. We were outsiders, but now we're the temple where he resides. First part of chapter 3, the gospel brings the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Pretty much everybody in this room. Anybody of Jewish heritage? Raise your hand for him. Sandra. Okay. So, Sandra, that means we're brought in. All of us now can be in fellowship with Sandra instead of excluded from fellowship in the family of God. Why? Because we're in Christ. Equal standing in God's family, displaying God's wisdom to all creation. That's what the church does. As the Spirit strengthens us, second half of chapter 3, with inner power, we're rooted and anchored in love, and we begin to grasp the expansive love of Christ. That's where we start this morning. So if we were to take the beginning of Ephesians 4, Pastor Mark started on... Uh, was it three week, three Sundays ago, I think, the beginning of chapter 4? Okay. And uh, all the way to chapter 5, verse 20, which, you know, it'll take us a while to get there. There's, there's things that the scripture here in Ephesians tell us to embrace. Sometimes Paul uses the figure of putting on, like putting on a jacket or a vest or a cobe, a, a cobe. <laughs> A robe, thank you very much, <laughs> or a coat, uh, putting it on. So, so that would be what we're supposed. That would be the invitation that we have, right? As Pastor Mark's talked about, invitation and challenge. So, there's all of these things. And by the way, the positive list is bigger than the negative one. Yeah. 
but they're both incredibly extensive lists. So as we move into Ephesians, now Paul is like getting down to details. He's told us all these amazing things that the Spirit of God revealed through him for the church that are true. But now he's, this is essentially what chapter 4 and 5 say. This is what Jesus' life in us looks like. We're going to spend a couple of chapters. This is what life in Christ looks like. This is, this is how we're supposed to be developing and growing and, and the Spirit of God producing His fruit in us. And as we do that, there's two things we need to do. We need to put on some stuff and we need to take off some stuff. Yeah. Invitation and challenge. Put on and take off. Anybody have some things you need to put on? Okay. I need to, now, here's the question. Anybody have things you need to take off? Okay. We have special ushers that will come and raise your hand for you. Or your family members. I was thinking, it would be really scary to hand this checklist to your next of kin. <laughs> Say, fill it out for me, honey. Yeah, you need to put that on, that on, that on, that on, that on, that and now you need to take these off. But we're going to do it for ourselves, okay? So I don't want you to do it right now. But here's what I'm asking. Would you take this home? I know it's Thanksgiving week coming up, but I bet you have five or ten minutes before you go to bed or when you wake up and just pull these notes in front of you and say, Lord, what do I need to put on? And focus on the things that you think are the most important, okay? Because really, we, couldn't we check all of them on, on the putting on? Of course we could. But, but you know, if, if you're pretty patient, then don't check patience. But if you know <laughs> that you're impatient, then you want to check that. And then you want to begin to talk to the Lord about that in the weeks ahead. So, so this is just like a very practical checklist for you. And then the second... I, I, your pages are a little different than mine. But the second list is the challenge, the things that we need to renounce and to take off. And I'd really love to read these, but you can all read, so I'm going to behave myself. And uh, I've done a little bit of, of definition in a few places where it was, it was helpful. So now we're going to dive into Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read 1 through 16, but we're going to focus on 11 through 16, just, just near the end. So, Father, we, we ask that you would make your word alive to us this morning. It's so easy to be dull of hearing or dull in our understanding, but you said, if, if you who have ears to hear, I want you to hear. And, Lord, we understand that when it comes to Scripture, only you can give us ears to hear. We can have a hungry heart. We can have an honest heart that's ready to grapple with the changes that are required. But only you can really give us ears to hear. Only your spirit can really enlighten scripture so that we truly understand what you're saying through it. And then we can do it. So we commit this time to you that you would speak to us, Lord. And we would walk out of this room better equipped, greater understanding, and challenged for what you want us to do. Amen. Amen. Okay, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And this is the have version as opposed to the have not. Uh, as a prisoner of the Lord, Paul writes, I plead with you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be, be patient with each other. Making allowances for others' faults because you love them. Work hard to preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as when you were called, you had one hope held out to you. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. God has given us the gift of Christ, and through Him, each one of us has been given Grace. Now, in this sense, the word grace means divine empowerment. When it says you're saved by grace, that is unmerited favor. But this grace means that God's empowering you. He's giving you grace, ability to be the person he's called you to be. 
This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men and women. That's a quote of Psalm 68, verse 18. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Okay, now what we're going to talk about this morning. It was he. Who's the he? It's a very safe answer. It's the answer to every Sunday school question. <laughs> Who's the he? Jesus. Jesus, right? It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. They are responsible to equip God's people. Would you point to yourself right now? Okay, so Pastor Mark, I I'm just going to shoot for this, and you can fix it later. But I would say Pastor Mark has an evangelist's heart and a pastor's heart. Is that fair? Yeah. Debbie, what do you say? Okay, we're checking with headquarters here. All right. <laughs> he has an evangelist's heart. He wants to see people come to Christ and develop and grow as disciples. And he has a pastor's heart or a shepherd's heart. Okay. So God has placed him in this body for a purpose. And the purpose is extremely clear. To equip. Okay, now we point to ourselves. Ready? One, two, three. To equip God's people, right, us, to do their particular ministry skillfully so that the body of Christ, that's the church, right? That's the people in the church, so that the body of Christ develops and grows until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, I'm going to pause for a second here because I love uh, obscure translations. In fact, I have one, Robert, this is my son-in-law, Robert, back there. He's the father of the assistant worship leader that was helping this morning and then she started to hug me while I'm playing piano I'm going Amber rescue me <laughs> God love her but I love obscure translations and I do have one saved in the library for you I'm waiting till the right time um, and one of those obscure translations called the unvarnished New Testament ren renders this verse of until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God he says it this way, until we all arrive at the unity of belief in and perception of the Son of God. I really like that. Unity, so we all have a unified faith in Christ, but we also all have the same Jesus that we're believing in. Now that's critical, because one of the issues with cults is they don't have the same Jesus that, that Christianity does, that orthodoxy does. I don't mean Greek orthodoxy or Russian orthodoxy, I mean orthodoxy, which means the shared faith from the first century till today and, and into eternity. Um, so, I'm just going to say it. Mormons have a different Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses have, have a different Jesus. New Age belief has a different Jesus. The New Age Jesus is Christ within. Not Christ within because Jesus died and rose and sent his spirit and you believed and by grace you're saved and the spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. No, everybody just has a Christ waiting to be revealed inside of you. That's not what scripture teaches. It's a different Jesus. So I really, it's really important that we have a common faith but we also have a common understanding of who Jesus really is. That he's the son of God, right? That he's co-eternal with the father. That he was born of a virgin. He was supernaturally in, incarnated in the Virgin Mary, right? Without any human help on the part of a male. I won't go into Mormon doctrine here, but I'll just say it's different. You could talk to Robert if you want details. He's, lo he's an apologist, okay? Um, that that he, he was fully God and fully human when he walked the planet and ministered. Amen? Yeah. He, and, and that he, he had this. He wasn't Casper the friendly ghost. He wasn't some, you know, manifestation that looked human but really wasn't. And that he actually died on the cross, that he bore our sins for us. Amen? I feel like it's my last message and I just want you to get the basics here. <laughs> These are the, this is the stuff we would die for in a sense, right? And then, but he didn't stay dead, amen? He rose from the dead on the third day and he manifested himself to his apostles, to the women who came to the tomb, to many others, and at one point to 500 people gathered at the same time, and then he ascended out of this dimension into the dimension of heaven, 
until he returns again. And when he returns, he's going to come to set the world right and collect his church. And the old order of things are going to pass away. And behold, he says, I am making everything new. That's our hope. Amen? That's the Jesus we believe in. And we can't let that get distorted, get diluted. Back to our text. Then, when we have this unity and understanding of who Jesus is and a unity of faith, then we will together be mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We will no longer be children. Children are the opposite of mature, right? Children are, by definition, not mature because they're still growing up. We'll no longer be children tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. We won't be led astray when unscrupulous people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. <laughs> Hasn't that happened throughout history? Haven't believers who really love Jesus and who had a proper understanding of much of Scripture, but, but somehow their foundation wasn't quite solid enough, or maybe they weren't connected to others, because that that's really helps us to not stray. And then they began to listen to and believe things that sounded like the truth, but were not true. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him, the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, harmoniously connected and joined together, grows in love to its full maturity by the proper functioning of all of its individual parts. What a passage. Now, the way I want to approach this this morning is going to be very simple. Anybody like simple? I like simple. When I just read those last couple of paragraphs, it's, it's really more than at least I can take in. You know, I try and put it into my brain, but as the new stuff's coming in, some of the old stuff's leaking out. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> One of my favorite sayings is Curly from the Three Stooges. He says, I'm trying to think, but nothing's happening. <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. <laughs> so... I want to share with you a very simple way to take a complex, you know, packed mess, a passage like we just read from verse 11 to 16. It's just six verses. It's just six verses, right? But in that six verses, there's so much. So how do we, how do we kind of be able to step back and take a look at that and not get lost? And not have to just take a couple of random things out of it. So this is one, this is one way to do that. And does, does anybody, I just have to ask this question. Does anybody here like the study of grammar? Okay, raise your hand. One, two, three. Oh, wow, this is quite a crowd. Very good. All right. I won't ask the alternate question. <laughs> I did not like the study of grammar until I took what ended up being my hardest class in college, which was hermeneutics. Legendary professor, everyone just, boy, before you took that class, you were scared to death. And it was mostly true. Um, but if you applied yourself, you're going to learn more than you ever did. Isn't that how hard teachers work? Yeah. Right? And so I never, I, I, I just didn't pay any attention to, pronouns and participle and verb tenses and sentence structure and all of that until in hermeneutics we had to do that and all of a sudden I had a really good reason to understand it because I wanted to understand God's word better and God's word is written in language, right? And although it's translated out of Greek and Hebrew and a little Aramaic, it comes to us in English and that sentence structure still represents how we're going to be able to unpack its meaning. So this simple Bible study method is called outline. I know for some people you have now stopped listening. Just, just the, the, the resonance of that word brings you back to eighth grade grammar and somebody, you know, pointing at you that you don't get it. But I want you to try and get a new view because outline is just simply kind of trying to take the bones, you know. It's, it's like, well, could we look at the skeleton of this thing? And then later we can put more flesh on it again. Do you know, you know structure is good, right? Skeletons are great things. If you didn't have a skeleton, you'd be an amoeba. You'd just be in a pool on the floor, 
and you wouldn't even be able to, you know, when, when Corinne says it's time to go say hi, you'd just be scooching along the floor, people would be stepping on you, it'd be a bad thing. So we're going to look at the bones of this scripture. So here we go. This is how, this is how I grappled with it. What is this really saying to us, Lord? So the first thing it says is that God has given us gifts. Now, not like you normally think of gifts, the gifts of, you know, prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and wisdom and knowledge and helps and, and healing and serving. No, these gifts are unique. This is the unique gift list in Scripture. Unlike 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, unlike Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us the people that God gifts to us. Like Pastor Mark. He's a gift to Foothill. Would you agree to that? No, he's, he's a gift. God sent him and Debbie here as a gift to Foothill. So God gives gifts. They're people. Okay, what do these people do? So we just keep going. Someday it's going to be up there, huh? That'll really help. Okay, these people, what do they do? There's one key word. Will you say it with me? They equip us. Will you say that? They, it's two words, I know, but equip is the word I can count. <laughs> they equip. Who do they equip? Us, right? What do they equip us to do? They equip us to do our ministry well. Okay, now pause. You know we can't really go on until we figure out something here? If Pastor Mark's job is to equip you to do your ministry well, and you don't know what your ministry is, that's going to be a problem, isn't it? He'll, you'll say, I'm ready to go. And I'll say, what do you want to do? I don't know. Well, what can you do? Well, I don't know. Well, what have you been gifted to do? I have no idea. Now, I know there's books and seminars and fancy tests you could take to fi figure out your spiritual gifts. I don't know if I'm... <clears throat> crossing any boundaries here, but I don't put a lot of stock in most of those. The way I found out my spiritual gifts, 20-year-old, I'm a hippie, I get saved, I get connected in church, and I just start doing stuff, right? The one way to be sure you'll never find out what your spiritual gift is is to not do stuff. If you just stay in your seat, now, you, I, it's good you're in your seat today. Please don't be offended. You're like, dude, I could leave right in the middle of your message. But if you just stay there and run out the door when service is over, right, and interact as little as possible, you'll probably never discover your spiritual gifts. Because I think they're discovered by doing. Isn't that, if that's true of a lot of life, right? If, if you... Like, okay, here's an example. My grandfather was a carpenter and a cabinet maker. He built furniture, he built homes, he built neighborhoods, okay? My dad built his first home. Michelle's dad built their first home. I built a doghouse. <laughs> That's called entropy, right? As the generations passed on by, I found out that that's really not my gift. I mean, I can make stuff, but... Don't ask Michelle how long it takes. Okay. My son, on the other hand, James, he builds stuff and it's great. And it's, it, you know, he doesn't need plans or anything. He's just, he got the gift. It skipped a generation. <laughs> but how did I find out I didn't have that gift? By building the doghouse, right? And I'm like, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to dream of building a house. My building has more to do with people. And it took me a while to understand that. How did I found, find out that I might have some kind of gift to teach the word? It was by saying, yes, Michelle and I will lead this youth group that needs leaders. Boy, that's, a, that's an exciting proposition, <laughs> right? And sitting on the edge of a stage, we were in a school at that time, you know, in an auditorium, hanging out with these teenagers, sitting on the stage, and I realized the Holy Spirit was there as we were talking about God's word. And I never, I, di I didn't know what that was until it happened, but when it happened, I knew what it was. And I'm like, they're listening. 
Now, later in my life, doing junior high youth group, it was another story. But luckily, God, God had already spoken that truth to me. They're listening. The Spirit of God's here. So I really want to encourage you, just try stuff. Try serving in the nursery. Try teaching the older kids. You know, try, try coming early and seeing what else you can do. Ask, this is a wonderful question. Ask Pastor Mark, what do you need help with around here? Right? Or ask, ask any team leader, you know, the, the offering team or, or greeting or whatever. Just say, how can I help? And then dive in and give it a shot. And don't, don't get discouraged on your first failure, amen? Because you could be really gifted and still make mistakes. You should have been here at practice while I was trying to play a certain part on the piano. You should have been here during service when I almost sang the wrong song. And right as I looked to Sandra to nod her in, she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like. Ah! And I look at the, the music in front of me. I'm like, oh, there's an entire song I'm skipping. Let's sing that. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> That's teamwork, amen? amen. Teamwork. What's your ministry? I'm going to challenge you. You need to know. If you don't know, then you need to find out by just starting to do stuff. It's, that sounds really sophisticated, doesn't it? I could write a book, just do stuff. <laughs> Open it up, every page just says, do stuff. Because pretty soon, you're going to start to get feedback from other people saying, you know, that really helped me. That's one of the most important ways. It's not always how you feel, but it's when somebody says, like, okay, Corinne. Corinne has, I don't even know, I guess you'd call it the gift of exhortation because she comes up here and she, you know, does the announcements and the off. But you notice in the announcements and the offering, there's also this other thing Corinne gives us. Wood. Yes. Sack you would, but. Do the rest of you, do you notice what she does? It's getting kind of scary, isn't it, Corinne? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> She's like, I thought I did it. I mean, I mean, she shares with us. She encourages us, right? She brings out something of Scripture or something of her life experience or other people's life experience. So in the middle of announcements, which might be pretty boring, we come out of that feeling really encouraged and, and edified, built up. So I'm giving you feedback right now, Corinne. I don't know about these guys, but I'm giving you feedback. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> so, like for me, when I started leading worship, <laughs> the first time I led worship was pretty rugged. And I wasn't playing any instrument or anything, but I was scared. <laughs> and you feel so exposed, you know. But... As time went on, people would come up to me afterwards and go, that, was, that really encouraged me. You know what you said between those songs? That really encouraged me. And so that feedback helped me understand, oh, maybe this is something I should do. Now, if people come up and said, that was terrible, you should never do that again, <laughs> that would have affected my future as well, right? <laughs> What's your ministry? I think there's, there's two, two ways to look at it. Who you are and what you do. Who you are is like the gifts that God's given you really since you were born, but as you're born again, they come into full fruitfulness. So f I'll just tell you what I believe mine are. Mine, I believe mine are encourager and, and teacher. Not because I think I'm amazing at either, but I just think those are areas that when I function in them, something good seems to normally happen and... I don't feel drained by it. I feel like fired up by it. What are yours? Because, and, and please don't do this. Don't go, I don't have any. <laughs> Santa skipped me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. Because the scripture says, the spirit of God has given us all gifts. So, if you want any help on that, Pastor Mark and I would love to talk to you more. See how I just volunteer you? And because it's so critical. He can't equip us to do our ministry well if we don't know what our ministry is. Amen? Amen. So, okay, I want to I encourage somebody else. So, Sydney, 
I love Sydney. Now, Sydney, a while back, she just came in. This is when, you know, you remember when I, you know, Pastor Sam got us going after COVID, and then, dang, nobody moved to Tennessee. <laughs> and, and we were pretty slim on the servers. Would you, anybody remember that? I remember, you know, making a list. Who does what? It was pretty short. But Sydney, like many other people, was one of those people who just saw a need, and all of a sudden she starts coming early and greeting at the, the ramp door, the cheater's door. I mean, it's not a cheater for everybody. Certain, certain people can come in that way, but others of us are supposed to go up those stairs. But anyway, that's another story. She just automatically said, hey, I see a need. I can stand there. I can greet. I can smile. I can hand out the handouts. That's how you learn what your ministry is. I want to ask you a question. Is coming into this building and being greeted by a loving heart with a warm smile valuable? Yes. Oh, yes. amen, it is. And we won't talk about Amber because that's... A <laughs> She's got it too. Okay. So if you don't know what your ministry is, that's your assignment. From now until you have some kind of answer. Don't try and figure it out in your head. Figure it out with your feet and your hands and your heart. Find somebody else, team up with them, see if you can help and see how it goes. Okay, so God has given us gifts who equip us to do what? To do our ministry well. Why? What's, what happens when we do our ministry well? So the church is built up. That word built up is the word edified. It's not a word we use a lot but you can see it's related to the word edifice or building, right? That's why we can say it's built up. I like to think of this in this concept. So the church people, right, people, we're not talking about buildings. So the church, the people become more of who they're supposed to be. That's how I like to think about being built up. Our ministry helps make the people in the local body of Christ that we're a part of more of who they're supposed to be. If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, that's someone who makes you less of who you're supposed to be, right? They tear you down, they drag you down, they cut you down, and pretty soon you feel demoralized. The, the Spirit of God and the people of God work the opposite way. When you're around people who are functioning in their ministry, you start to feel like and understand who you really are, right? You're more of who you're supposed to be. I got to tell a little story here. If I've told it before, I apologize. Just say Rob's old. I mean, <laughs> but I, I want to tell it because I, I think it's I think it's helpful. So I bet it was 25 years ago. Um, I was in my driveway, and and I was talking to a friend. His name was Brian. Still is. And um, and we were at the back of my. Nissan pickup truck I had at the time. I don't remember what we were talking about. But I remember at one point, I think, I think I had my foot up on the bumper or something. And as we were talking, it had nothing to do with the conversation. All of a sudden, something started to happen to me that was extremely profound. This is how God works sometimes. He just sneaks up on you, right? And, and, and there's, no, there's no hint of what he's going to do. So, Brian and I are theoretically still talking, but Rob is starting to go away. I don't think Brian noticed it. I think I was able to, you know, continue saying something that made some kind of sense. But what happened was, and I don't know how long it was, but I began to feel like the person I was supposed to be. Like the person that Jesus designed me to be, saved me to be, put his spirit in to be, and the person that at the destination of my, the end of my life or in the life to come, that God made me to be. And I have to tell you, okay, now, I've told you before, in my past I've run uh, insecure, which is why God had a joke and made me a pastor, you know, because let's try this. So I run insecure, um, it's very easy in groups for me to just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm really not as competent as other people around me. I've, I've discovered something in my old age. I'm a master of nothing. 
and it's okay. I'm like a handyman, you know. Just don't ask me to build your house. But <laughs> So w- with that background, I'm standing there. I've got my foot up on the bumper of the truck, and I, I'm going away. And, and I began to feel like the person that God created me to be and saved me to be. I got to tell you, it was good. <laughs> it was different. He wasn't insecure. There was no fear. There was no comparison. It wasn't about me being awesome or anybody else being better than me or me being less. It was just profoundly whole. I guess that's the best way I can say it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, praise God. This is awesome. And then he starts to take me back. It wasn't a permanent voyage, see, because life was supposed to be that voyage. And pretty soon, I'm back in the conversation with Brian, and I'm right back how I was when I left. But I need to tell you something. I will never, ever, ever forget that because that's the destination for every one of us. It has nothing to do with me in particular. I really want you to get that is who God has made you to be. Compassionate, kind, fearless, no anxiety. In fact, if you look at these lists that we've put together, I've given you today, if you look at those lists, that'll describe you. The things that you aren't on the challenge part, the takeoff part, and the things that you are in Christ on the put on part. You know, our biggest challenge is to not see ourselves through other people's eyes or our eyes, but through his. Through his. And you know what his eyes are like because the word of God tells you. And we've spent a lot of time talking about that in the last year. Gifts, people who equip us to do our ministry well so the church is built up so we become more of who we're supposed to be until we reach unity in faith and knowledge of Christ. We talked about that already. What is that? That results in maturity. Ah, now we're beginning to get to a destination. What some translations will say a complete man or a whole person, right? Because mature, if you're growing corn, I've grown corn and missed the maturity part and got to the tough part. <laughs> Pastor Mark says Amen. But I know that when there's a corn plant with no ears, it's not mature, right? And I know that when there's a corn plant with a little ear, it's not mature. But when that, uh, what's it called? The silk starts to come out, and the silk turns brown, and every silk has been pollinated because everyone's connected to a kernel, I know now that ear of corn is mature, and it's ready for its purpose. The goal of this ministry, which makes us more of who we're supposed to be and brings us into unity and faith and knowledge of Christ, results in maturity. We just start to grow up into being the human beings and the followers of Jesus that we're supposed to be. I just like to look at you. I like to dream Sometimes I look at you and I just dream what God, what his destiny, right? What his purpose, what his plan is for you. So this maturity, what it does is it ensures stability. And in particular, the text tells us that it's doctrinal stability. So important for a church. Because all this stuff can start to happen. And if a church gets off on what's true, then it's all wasted. We become, we kind of take an off-ramp of the from the highway we're supposed to be on, and we're no longer doing what he intended. So this maturity results in stability. And as this maturity and stability develops, we begin to be vitally connected to each other in love. I know this is Pastor Mark's heart. (laughs) Connection, connection. Can I pick on you just a little more? One person said yes. Okay, that's a go. Um, You have to get over your shyness to be connected. 
I know some people are extroverts. An extrovert doesn't mean you're better at connecting. It just means you look like you're better at connecting. <laughs> right? You have to get over your shyness. You just, you just take a chance. Some people like say, what do I say? I'll give you, can I tell you a secret of how to talk to people you don't know? Ask them about themselves. Don't talk about yourself, because pretty soon they'll go, I, I got an appointment, and, you know. But ask them about themselves. Well, you know, where do you live? What do you do? What, what, what was it like? I mean, you, the questions just flow naturally as you start to find out more about them. You ask more questions. Because A, that people know about themselves, so you're not making them intimidated in any way. And B, people generally like to talk about themselves. Not in a bad way, right? But to be connected, we have to, we have to find out about each other. We have to find out what's important to other people. And this insecure guy now just loves to hang out with people that he doesn't know very well. And just like, I want to find out more about you. And I've learned that people are very wonderful creations. Amen. I love that you say that. You like people. I know some pastors who don't really like people. That's kind of a problem. <laughs> I think people are amazing. Are people perfect? No, but, you know. Neither am I, so it doesn't really matter. So connected. Every member connected in love. And as that happens, something else starts to happen. Not just you and your ministry, but the whole body, us, right? And us, however we grow in the future. But right now, it's us right here. The whole body starts to function. It's almost like if you get all the parts of the car together. Terry can tell you about this. Oh, another thing I'm not gifted in is mechanics, so um, excuse the analogy. <laughs> but if you get all of the parts together, let's say you built a car and you put everything in it except for the starter. Terry, how would that go? Uh, not very. You put the key in, nothing happens. What's wrong? But once all the parts are together, including the starter, you put the key in, that car does something that it's never done before, right? I guess it was a V8. That's the dream of God for us. As we walk through this process, and it's not very complicated, is it? Gifts who equip us to do our ministry well so the church is built up. And we reach unity and faith and knowledge in Christ. And we become mature and we have stability and we're connected in love. Then we really start to, not that we haven't been functioning, but then we really start to function to the degree God intends as each of us relates to Christ as the head. So that's the way I try and work through a passage like this that is so full and so profound that I feel intimidated by. It. How do you eat an elephant? One bite. One bite at a time, right? You don't just take the entire, I don't care if it's a baby, you, you can't do it. So if we break stuff down into the proper pieces and kind of digest it, that's what we've done this morning. And we're like, oh. Now it makes a lot more sense. That's the dream of God for us. One more thing that you might try is to put it into a single sentence. Certain passages you wouldn't be able to do this with. It'd have to be two or three. But I have the gift of commas. So here we go. Here's my shot. <clears throat> it has, a, it has a, a, a phrase introducing it. Okay. The purpose of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip each of us to minister so the body grows and is united, mature and stable, with every member connected and functioning with Christ as our head. That's the goal. So, thank you. You guys are too kind. Okay, so what do we do? The first thing we do, I don't think I have it on our list here, but it's, it's implied. I just made that up. I don't know if it's implied or not. First thing we do is figure out what our ministry is, right? Just a starting point. It doesn't mean your ministry is going to stay that forever or we'll never expand to other things, but we need to discover what our ministry is. And then this is what we need to do. We need to embrace our spiritual leaders as gifts of God from God to us. And this morning I'm focused on Pastor Mark. He's a gift of God. 
He didn't come because we offered him a $250,000 salary. Right? <laughs> he didn't come because this was the biggest church, right? He came because he and Debbie sought the Lord for quite a few months and said yes. And by the way, thank you for saying yes, yes. both of you. Yes. Both of you. Thank you for saying yes. We embrace our spiritual leaders because we understand they're a gift from God. We discover and develop and move out in our spiritual gifts. I knew it was in there. We strive for unity and love. So if somebody, if somebody is weird, everybody's a little weird, right? I'm, I'm really weird, so I have, you know, I understand. But if somebody's a little weird or a little different, here's what the scripture says. Let's go back to our text real quick. It says, it's right here, right here. I told you it was here. Okay. Make allowances for others' faults because you love them. So if I do something, you know, an omission or just maybe sounds a little bit rude, or, you know, what we do is we believe the best about people instead of assuming the worst, right? So if I say hi to Chuck and some Sunday morning he just goes, <laughs> Am I going to get an attitude? Oh, that Chuck. I sang the song he liked this morning, and he didn't even <laughs> say hi to me. No, I'm going to say, you know what? I love Chuck. Maybe he's having a rough day. It's okay. It's so easy, but it's so dangerous to go the other way, right? All of a sudden now, next time I see Chuck, I'm like, well, I'm going to go talk to Richard. <laughs> see? No, no. We make allowances for other people's faults because we love them. Strive for unity and love. Be connected to other members of the body. And as Pastor Mark has sort of begun <laughs> to focus on, and I know will more in the future stay connected to the head, is Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I'm excited for what's ahead. Can you tell something good is happening? If we're, you, it's like, it's, I mean, we're not bragging on us, we're bragging on Jesus, but yes, we can. So... Um, why don't you stand if you're able? I just want to say a little prayer over us all. Remember what the book of James says. If you're a hearer of the word and you don't do it, you're like a person who looks in the mirror and when you walk away, you forget what you look like. We want to be doers of this passage. Amen? So that God's dream for this church, which is God's dream for this community, right? Our families, our neighbors, our friends, people we don't know that he's going to send here or we're going to reach in the community and invite them in. His dream happens because we do this word. So, Father, I pray that by your spirit, uh, the simplicity and purity of what you gave to the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago and he wrote down in these six verses would be something that pumps in our heart, that our minds reflect on, that our behavior responds to. And I pray for anybody in this room who would honestly say, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. I don't know what my giftings are in general. I pray, Lord, that you would begin to reveal that to them. You'd bring people into their life that they can partner with in some kind of ministry. I pray that you'd help them to see the stuff inside of them, that you created them that way so they can reach out to people who are hurting, people that are, that are kind of tough on the outside, people that are confused, people that need love. Father, we pray that as you have given us the gift of Pastor Mark in this body, that this sequence of equipping and maturity and growth and stability and connection and love and function will be something we experience on an increasing and an ongoing basis, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the promise of your word. Amen. 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 Hey, happy Thanksgiving.
just a few days away. We are thankful for you, I can tell you that.